Welcome to uh, this special episode of Fast Forward, which is coming to you from CapClave 2014. We are honored to have as our guest for this episode, Holly Black. Now, many of you know her for the series, The Spiderwick Chronicles, but she's written a number of different series and recently published a standalone novel called mm -hmm. Doll Bones, which not only was named as receiving a Newbery Honor Award, but has just received the 2014 Mythiopic Fantasy Award for Children's Literature. So Holly, welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been very excited. It's been a good year. It has been a good year, but let's, let's, let us go back in time. Okay. Let's, let's start. You graduated from college with, now a, degree you have in, gone back in time. with, with a degree in literature. Uh -huh. But you didn't start. You didn't start publishing right away. You had a number of different jobs before you. Uh -huh. Were you writing the entire time while you were kind of working and finding your where your place was? I was. I, I wrote. You know, when I was a kid, um, I wrote uh, through college, and then um, I went and I had a job as a production editor on medical journals, like the Journal of Hand Surgery and the Journal of Pain. <laughs> oh well, what fun! <laughs> and then I did some uh, I did some pharma, uh, pharmaceutical market research, and all the while I was working on my first novel, Tithe. Um, it, I was trying to figure out how to how to write a book. I mean, you know, uh, I, my early drafts of Tithe were just a bunch of elves sitting around drinking coffee, experiencing ennui. I had no idea how to actually make plot move. I had no idea, you know, I, I and. Um, it took me a long time to, it probably took me six years to finish that book. And by the time it was done, it was obviously a completely different book um, from the book I had begun. Mm -hmm. The plot had changed, everything had changed, the characters' names had changed. There were possibly a few sentences that remain as <laughs> strange artifacts of, of the book I began. Uh, but m almost everything had, had, had you know, I, I published as soon as I could. It just took me a while. Well, now, the first book comes, Tithe, Tithe comes out, but what is it, less than a year and a half later, all of a sudden you drop two novels in the Spiderwork Chronicles series. They're very series. small. They're extremely small. And I sold Tithe um, in 2000. And, you know, it just uh, took that long, it just to, took come that long to come out. Um, you know, the editing process and, and putting it on the schedule. And um, yeah, I, my friend Tony Diderlizzi, who by that point had, he had, he had done a lot of um, illustrations uh, in many different places, but he had, uh, I think, two picture books at the time, was starting um, work on this uh, illustrated guide to fairies. And I really wanted him to work on it. And I said, you know, I've been working on this, I've been working on Tide, which is a fairy book. I'll, I'll do a bunch of, I'll write, you know, the descriptions of these creatures. Mm -hmm. It was going to be great. You know, there's <laughs> these little paragraph descriptions. And we went to, we had the same editor. Um, who he had introduced me to, and our editor, Kevin Lewis, said, maybe you could tell the story of the, the guide. And, you know, we were like, I guess, but the guide is what really matters here. And, um, but, but, you know, we went off and we talked about it together and plotted out the Spiderwick books, and they're, they're very, very short chapter books. And I wrote them, and Tony illustrated them, and that's how we wound, and then they wound up coming out before the guide. And you know, by the time the guide came out, people were like, oh, and also the guide. And we were like, no, this is the <laughs> book we meant to be doing. So, so, so basically, the Spiderwick books come out, and then what they're based on comes out, and everybody thinks, oh, they made that up, so go with the thing. <laughs> but this was the thing that, you know, this was Tony's project that he had, he had really wanted, you know, to do. And, 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 the, and what was contained in there was what drove the plot and identified mm -hmm. the characters in yeah, the Chronicles. Absolutely. Well, now, it was a tremendous success. I mean, especially by the time you got to the fifth book, you were on it. To, to our great Cellar surprise, list. yes. <laughs> and, and so how did that change? Your relationship with publishers, and, your, and, and did it open up opportunities for you to do, to explore whatever you thought would be interesting and interesting to you and interesting to readers? I mean, I think so. I think you know, certainly when you have a series that that is successful. I mean, you know, when you're starting out as a writer and as a reader, and you know, particularly as a fantasy writer and reader, you you think of yourself as being a little bit not left of mainstream, you know? And so when something really works and people respond to it, you realize, oh, people like what I like. And it was a big surprise to, be, really? to think, wow, people love the thing I love. You know, I was sort of used to being, you know, somebody who loved things that I didn't know that many people who also loved. And, uh, you know, 
so yeah, and it certainly uh, publishers, my publisher was, you know, had more confidence that people would love what I loved as well. Did you find, did you, did you have to fight against people wanting another Spiderwork Chronicles approach to, to your work? I think because it was a collaboration, it was a little bit easier for that not to be the case. Um, because, you know, for us to do more spider work, it would be getting the band back together. Uh -huh. And so, and I think also it was good that both Tony and I had individual projects that we kept doing while we were doing spider work. I did two more modern fairy tale books, um, Valiant in 2005, mm -hmm. and then Ironside in 2007. And so I think people expected mm -hmm. us to continue doing the kind of individual work we had been doing. Now, you in uh, in 2013, mm -hmm. you wrote a standalone young adult novel called the uh, the coldest girl in Cold, Cold Town. Town. Now, mm -hmm. you, moving from Spider Work Chronicles, which which, which, which Chronicles, which is uh -huh. which is got a lot of stuff going on, but still, it's really kind of gentle in in a, in a lot it's of very, ways. Very, I mean, they're very they're very um, short chapter books for you know. Mm -hmm. So the average reader being a 10 year old yeah did you did you feel the need to vamp up was that what this was about <laughs> well i mean i think that if i mean my first novel tithe was a ya novel a teen novel it was very dark mm -hmm. and so i think that Coltown town follows in the vein of pretty much all of my teen work you know i've i've been working in two different you know i've write, written middle grade you know spider rick doll bones and now um, i just have the first book in a co-written series the Magisterium series that which, I'm doing which with. Which we will talk uh, about. But that's all my, you know, my middle grade work, which is very different from my teen work. Mm -hmm. So Cold Town falls, I think, squarely into the teen work. Well, what I found interesting about Cold Town is how you, how you created the vampires that are in this story <laughs> and the type of vampirism that mm -hmm. exists in the world. Uh, we're not talking about the... Uh, well, we are talking to a certain extent about you know, bitten, infected, turn, uh, but they, in your book, they don't usually let them live to turn. Well, right, they've been a sort of 88-day incubation period that, that people who are infected with vampirism have, and if they have blood during that time, then they die and rise again as vampires, which allowed me to do certain things that I needed to do for the book. And, and, and what was fascinating was the way that you drew the world's reaction to this. It wasn't, oh, kill them all. It's let, well, just gather them all together and we'll tape them. <laughs> what, what was, what, when did you decide that social media had become so degraded that watching <laughs> vamps was the way to go? Well, uh, well, I mean, so I started, uh, The Coldest Girl in Cold Town was originally a short story that I wrote for uh, an anthology. Um, and I, it was a vampire anthology, and I agreed to write the story, and then I had that mm -hmm. moment of being like, wait, what, what, what in the world am I gonna do? And um, I had been a big fan of vampire books um, when I was a teenager. Uh, when I was in eighth grade, I probably read Interview with the Vampire, like, nightly, like, over and over and over. I was obsessed, and I read, um, you know, Puppy Zebrite's Lost Souls. I read Tabith Lee's, um, oh, what is that book? It's a Vampire Amaris book. Fabulous. Um, and um, yeah, uh, Sunglasses After Dark, the Nancy Collins book. And, um, and so what I wanted to do was kind of come back to some of the stuff that I had really loved. And so um, I somehow sort of started figuring out how can I have everything I want um, in a vampire story. And so I wound up with these sort of walled cities where I could have all kinds of decadent things happening, where there's these quarantine areas. And um, I also must say that I think the reality TV stuff came from my own. I watch a lot of reality television. I know it's not, I, I, I'm teased extensively by my friends for it. I don't, I, I I find it very relaxing, um, and based based on based on a recent article, you and Jennifer Lawrence have a lot in common. I, I cannot stop, and so and I became really fascinated with um, mm -hmm. the moments when real reality intrudes on reality television because we all know it's scripted and we all know mm -hmm. it's manipulated. But um, there are these moments. For instance, there was a show called Megan Wants a Millionaire. Perhaps you may have seen it. 
No. <laughs> I, I, I will admit to have, I will admit to have seen promos for it. Oh, All excellent! Right. So, Megan Wants a Millionaire was an offshoot of Rock of Love with Brett Michaels, which was in turn an offshoot of Flavor of Love with Flavor Flav. Yes. Anyway, yes, I, so we get I to Megan Wants a Millionaire. Yes, I know the genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, at some point, um, as the show is taping or as I guess after the show is finished taping, but while it's being shown, um, it turns out that one of the contestants in really real life killed his girlfriend. And so I they- remember this story. Right, and they stop, they, you know, VH1 stops airing the show, they shut it down, and um, allegedly, excuse me, he allegedly killed his girlfriend because they were never able to try him for it because then he killed himself. And so, you know, they, VH1 like salted the earth. We've never had an of love since then. And I was really fascinated because what happens when really real life intrudes? And then we had, um, uh, a few years later, we had The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. um, where one of the women's- Which is an oxymoron in and of itself. <laughs> one of the women's husbands uh, killed himself. And they didn't shut it down. They recut the season and they showed it and at the reunion, that was as, part as of, the of course you know, line, of course. at the reunion, Lisa Vanderpump, one of the actually, she's the actual person on the show. I did not make up this name. Um, Somebody did. And she, uh, she said, I don't know if we should have done this. And I thought, Lisa Vanderpump, you make a fine point. But I'd watched it, mm -hmm. and I had felt nothing. I just watched it, you know? And I thought, this is really interesting. This is an interesting, terrible thing I've learned about myself. And this is an interesting thing about the distance. You know, we have in television, um, and I thought, well, okay, if there was a walled city with vampires in it, and they killed people mm. sometimes, would I watch it? Clearly, I am the target audience for it. <laughs> <laughs> now you're beginning to scare me a little bit. <laughs> and I mean, if there was a vampire that came into this room and began feasting on one of the audience, would I take a picture with my phone? <laughs> well, there is an exit right here, and I probably could get through it. <laughs> so, maybe. <laughs> Would I upload it to Instagram? I mean, once I got out. <laughs> and like, and, the, and so I became sort of fascinated with my own terribleness <laughs> and, 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 um, and my own engagement with sort of reality television and social media, and that's where Cold Town came out of. Well, let's talk about social media and <laughs> writers. Uh huh. Because, boy, has the world changed in 10 years for authors in terms of. That's venues for publishing, how you publicize yourself, uh, the level of interaction you have with the people who enjoy your writing and some people who don't through the social media. Uh -huh. How has, what kind of a change have you seen since you started writing and publishing in the way social media has become a part of the day-to-day -day life of writers? Well, um, I started publishing in 2002. And um, there were certainly journals then, like online journals. Live journal was really was big at that time. Um, but with the advent of Twitter and Tumblr, things are even fat, like things move even more quickly. Um, and you do have the ability to uh, to really interact with your fans. And I think the most positive thing is you can interact with your fans the world over. Like you can have people write to you from anywhere in the world and be able to like have that relationship and that interaction, which is really great. Um, it is probably really different, but I have to say it's mostly been the world that I've been publishing into. It's just gotten faster and faster. What, uh what do you do with the feedback? I mean, I mean, you must get feedback, very frank feedback. I'm, maybe I'm just thinking of Yelp, but, but what, what kind of, you know, when you get people coming to you with left, right, and center, I mean, you know, this is great, this is great, this is the best book I've ever read. How could you have done this to this character, all this other stuff, right. on a continuous basis? I mean, how do you, do you have to concentrate to shut that out when you want to go right? How, what is your, how do you? I think you have to not give in to, to, to too much temptation in terms of seeking it out. I think, uh, you know, when I first, you know, when Tithe first came out, I Googled myself, I'll admit it. And I found things both good and bad. And I felt like I should read all of that and I should know all of it. And at some point I realized, um, it was after I read a really, a really beautiful, great review 
Um, and I couldn't write afterward because as I was writing, I thought this isn't as good. This person won't like it as much. And I thought I have to stop. And so, you know, things still kind of wash up on my shores, mm -hmm. but I don't seek it out. And it's actually amazing how much you don't see if you don't seek it out, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I get trade reviews and, and people tweet things at me and I sort of, and, and I, you know, I, have a, I think I have a sense of what people feel, but I don't look for that stuff. And, and, and I, that seems to, uh, you know, I need to create some kind of distance when I'm actually writing because I need to believe personally that this, this thing that I'm making, I'm just making for me and then later I have to acknowledge the fact that it will be, you know, foisted out into the world, and that people will either, you know, like it or not like it. But, but while I'm creating it, I think it has to feel personal and 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 private. While I was studying Dollbones, I was reading some of the reviews, and I think what fascinated me most was how people were latching on to the idea of three three childhood friends who were each dealing with moving on to into adolescence mm -hmm. differently, and that, that that speech the one talks about the the other two leaving her mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. was just heartbreaking. What uh, was this, when you were writing this, I mean, you have the mystery of the ghost and the doll and all of that other stuff, but was, it, was this meant to be an examination of the transition from childhood to adolescence and what yeah. that involves? And yeah, I mean, it, yes, it, it absolutely was. I mean, I, it was a book I wanted to write for a really long time. Um, I remember very vividly the experience of uh, giving up playing dolls with my friends. Uh, and, you know, at the time, I wanted to play, I wanted to continue all of these stories that were very elaborate stories. And um, it, when, you know, my friends wanted to do other things, uh, mostly music. Music was the thing that sort of destroyed our game. Um, oh. And it, it was very, you know, very hard for me to give up, and I thought that that was because I was, like, that there was something immature about myself. And so as, you know, an adult, and as somebody who's now a professional writer, I'm able to parse the fact that I didn't want to stop telling stories with my friends because I didn't want to stop telling stories. And exactly. That, but, but our way of talking about shared storytelling is really about it being something immature and childish and something that must be given up. And it's actually really, really strange that we feel like that's something that has to be given up because it is something that is, you know, like for all of time we have sat around fires and told stories together. You know, when you are, in, if you, you know, work in television, you sit around a big table and you make up stories together. There is nothing inherently childish about this, but we have decided that it's something that has to be given up. Before the printed word, story was the only way you pass knowledge on. And so why is it that co-storytelling is this something, is something that there's a very specific point that if you keep wanting to do it, you're a late bloomer and there's all of this, like there's all of this stuff around it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know why, but I really wanted to write about it and I wanted to write about these three kids who didn't want to give it up and what the forces that were sort of making them give it up. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you about this new project because this okay. is the first time you've worked with other artists, but this is the first time you're working with, with another writer to put a series together. And she's a well-established writer. I mean, Mortal Instruments, Absolutely. for heaven's sakes. So has it changed the way that you, has it changed your storytelling approach because you're dealing, you're collaborating with someone more completely on the word side of the thing? Yes, I mean, it's very different than, you know, when I was collaborating with Tony, we would work out what happened in the books, but then mm -hmm. I would go off and, and write it. And, you know, with Cassie, we're writing it together. We, we have a strange process by which I will write like 500 words or so, mm -hmm. and then she will write over those words and edit them, and then she'll write 500 words or so, and I'll write over those and to try and get one voice, um, which I recognize is not the most normal way of co-writing, but we, um, but we really enjoyed it. Well, if you enjoyed it and it works, it's normal. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, we've known each other for 12 years. Uh, we've been really good friends. And so it's really, really fun working with someone that, that I really like and, um, and that, you know, I, I know well enough, you know, that we're able to really be honest with each other about what we're doing and, and work through our disagreements pretty quickly and, and mostly have fun. So. You're going to have fun for four more books yep. in a five-book series. 
And then, maybe like Spiderwick Chronicles, there'll be a <laughs> film about the whole thing. It's funny, when we, yeah, I mean, maybe, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of books. We need to get through four more books, you know? <laughs> Iron Trial just came out, so, you know, let's, 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 let's get through this. <laughs> you know, I the, guess there's a lot of Mortal Instruments books to do, too. You don't know how greedy readers are. You really <laughs> don't understand, do you? <laughs> people, you talk about social media. People have tweeted at, at us and been like, so, after you finish Magisterium, will there be a collegium? And we're like, really? <laughs> we have four more books? <laughs> Holly, I'm sorry we're out of time. It's, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for coming to visit us. We Thank really do you. appreciate it. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schott saying, take care.